what we do know is that um, uh, the older you are, the higher the chances of you becoming seriously ill or even dying with the new coronavirus. Um, this age-dependent effect is quite dramatic. If you're male, you're always also more likely to have a severe disease cause or, or even to die. The reasons for that and why it's better to be female in that context um, are not really clear. <laughs> it is a contagious virus. It is relatively easy to transmit. At the moment, we estimate that one infected person will on average infect more than two, 2.5, 3. Um, other individuals, of course, that depends very much on how close in, uh, how close the contact is that you have with other people. And so, the moment we think um, the, the so-called case fatality rate, so the chance of you dying if you have a documented laboratory documented infection, is somewhere in the one to two percent range. Um, the true figure is almost certainly lower um, because not every person who is infected with the virus is currently diagnosed as being infected. But if you um, compare that to other respiratory infections, then obviously this new virus is much more dangerous than your common cold. Um, so even a common cold, a harmless respiratory infection can cause serious problems for an elderly person, for example. So this virus is definitely more dangerous than the common cold. Um, there's still some debate as to whether it's more dangerous than the seasonal influenza, so the influenza disease that we see um, each winter. Um, at the moment it looks as if it is more dangerous than the normal seasonal influenza, but quite how much more dangerous is a little uncertain still. So it's up to two weeks, um, between a few days and up to two weeks. Um, and um, what we um, think is the case now is that even before you fall ill, so that defines the end of the incubation period, um, you may actually already be excreting virus and uh, be in a position where you can pass the virus on to other people. That's the million dollar question <laughs> and, and I think if the uh, authorities knew that they would be much more relaxed. Um, it's very difficult to predict. We've already seen different scenarios uh, that have played out. Obviously the massive outbreak in China. We've had quite significant outbreaks in South Korea and also in Italy. Um, but we've also had other examples where individual cases did um, appear in, in other countries um, but which did not seed um, another local outbreak. Um, so it, it can vary, it can, it can vary tremendously. Um, in Germany at the moment um, we have a bigger cluster of cases in North Rhine-Westphalia but that will trigger a massive outbreak or a bigger outbreak like in Northern Italy um, is very hard to predict. It is, in the early stages, um, possible in theory to contain an outbreak and we've had several examples of the health authorities being capable of doing that. So the initial cluster in, in Bavaria was very efficiently contained, um, we have other examples in other countries. Um, and um, so we can only keep our fingers crossed and hope that the um, uh, health authorities and public health authorities um, um, will manage to contain little local outbreaks that we will definitely be seeing more of. So the, the discussion at the moment is um, as to when this year's epidemic will die down. Um, based on what we know from other respiratory infections, they usually tend to occur in the winter and they tend to calm down um, as spring appears and the weather gets warmer. So I think there's reason to hope that this will also be the case for the new coronavirus, but we're not certain that it will be the case. Um, usually it takes some time to develop vaccines and, and drugs, um, so I think the good news here is that um, people started developing vaccines against SARS in um, 2003 and against MERS in 2012. And the efforts to develop a MERS vaccine have been um, going on, have been continued over the last few years. So, although we don't have a vaccine yet that is approved for clinical use for these two viruses, we've learned a lot how to generate, how to design, how to construct vaccines against coronavirus. And I think we will definitely benefit from that and that will shorten the development process. So I think the optimist would say we may have a vaccine candidate maybe later this year, maybe early next year. 
but then um, these things will still have to be tested in clinical trials. Um, so I think a reasonable time frame would be probably something in the range of one to two years, if not a little longer. The question is, um, can we use an existing drug that's already been approved for clinical use for other diseases against this coronavirus? Of course, we have some antiviral drugs. Um, um, people in China, for example, have been trying to use some of the HIV protease inhibitors against this coronavirus. Um, if um, these drugs turn out to be efficacious against the new coronavirus, then it's relatively quick, and we may be able and may have enough clinical data to um, recommend using these drugs against coronavirus in the next few months um, or maybe um, later in the year. On the other hand, if we have to start develop, developing a drug from scratch, um, the time frame there is more like five years or longer. Most likely, yes, although again, we're not 100% certain that that is the case. Um, um, different labs are currently in the process of developing um, antibody tests, which, which which we can use to measure antibodies and also protective antibodies. Um, so um, we'll have to wait until um, these tests are available and have been used to test the immunity in people who have survived an infection. And uh, But based on the experience uh, that we have with other similar viruses, I think the chances are that we may you may well end up with an immunity um, after you've overcome an infection. Well, I think what this virus, like other respiratory viruses, shows is that um, it depends very much um, on how old you are, whether you have other underlying diseases, um, how severely ill you will become with this virus, and um, trying to understand why some people are more likely to be affected by this virus. Um, that's the kind of topic we work on in, in RESIST. Um, and the idea is if we had a better understanding of why some people suffer more badly from certain viruses, um, uh, we may use that information to either predict and select those people who need particular treatment, or maybe even to devise particular forms of treatments that address individual weaknesses in the immune response. So in a little, in a way, it's maybe comparable to the story of the artificial hip. Um, so once people had realized what the underlying reason was, um, what sort of local damage is done to the joint, um, and then the engineers came along and developed um, procedures that you could insert that would stay there, uh, the material of which would be such that the hip would last for many, many, many years as it does these days. That all took time to develop and, and uh, to, to develop and um, Maybe we're now in a situation where, um, with the um, inefficiencies or deficiencies of the immune system, we can, by understanding these deficiencies better, one day capitalize on this improved understanding and, and come up with better therapies um, um, to address specific weaknesses.